So we have uh, Natalie Pope and Sarah Asenzo, Asenzo. and I, I don't know, I'm, I always love those commercials of the guy carrying the chocolate running into the guy carrying the peanut butter and some of they came out with a, a delicious uh, thing. And we sort of have that kind of situation uh, going on here. So uh, Natalie Pope is an asso associate professor in the School College of Social Work at the University of Kentucky. And she brings to the table the um, qualitative research approach to understanding the lived experiences of people with a particular fo a focus on older folks and on caregiving roles. And Sarah Asenzo brings uh, a trauma focus and together they've found something I think that's very interesting and potentially important. And they actually won an award, the Rose Dobroff Award for the, uh, their article on this particular topic, which they're gonna talk about today, which is the role of trauma recovery and homelessness among older adult men. So we're quite uh, excited. So Sarah is an assistant professor at North Carolina State University, but she is in fact an alum of the, uh, of the University of Kentucky's esteemed College of Social Work. So thank you both Natalie and Sarah for agreeing to share your experiences and wisdom with us. And we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so here's just a quick outline of what we're gonna talk about. So we are going to um, discuss some gaps in knowledge um, regarding the relationship between trauma and chronic homelessness among older men. Uh, we're gonna report findings from our interviews that we did with, uh, with older men who um, were experiencing chronic homelessness and also um, as, you know, and present data that they shared with us about their experiences um, with past trauma and present trauma. And then we're gonna, from this data, hopefully offer some implications for service provision um, for homeless folks. So um, many of you probably know the nation's population is aging. Um, and as the nation's population is aging, so are, um, folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, so individuals in their 50s and 60s um, constitute the largest cohort of people within the homeless population. Um, research estimates that about a third to over one half of single homeless adults are now 50 and older. And when we talk about um, older adults in particular populations, um, people who are homeless, people who are in prison, um, older adult, adulthood, quote unquote, starts at age 50 um, versus age 65, which is when we typically think of that. Um, and also most people who are homeless have experienced trauma over the course of their lifetime. Um, and research has already kind of found this link between housing instability and um, trauma and childhood. And so um, for this paper and for this study more broadly, we took a, a broad conceptualization of trauma. So as opposed to a more narrowly defined diagnostic conceptualization of trauma, right? So um, for example, for those of you that are clinicians, criterion A of our, of our post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. And so this information comes from SAMHSA's um, concept of trauma and guidance on a trauma-informed care approach. And I think they, the, they do a really nice job of kind of teasing out in this, in this broader conceptualization of trauma some of the really important components. So of course, trauma results from an event or a series of events or set of circumstances that are experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that have lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and well-being um, potentially throughout their lifespan. And I think it's important to realize that this, this, this definition of trauma really incorporates three important aspects. And so these are on the right hand of the slide. So first of all is the event itself. So a traumatic event can occur at different levels of our ecological system. So for example, we might have an individual trauma where we're the only individual um, who has experienced the traumatic event. An example might be a car accident where no one else was involved. We also can have an interpersonal level of trauma that involves other people. This of course might, in, in, um, might include uh, child maltreatment and various forms of child maltreatment, sexual violence, intimate 
uh, partner violence or domestic violence and so forth and so on. We also can have traumatic events that occur at the group level or even at the mass level. Um, and these events and can be experienced in a variety of different ways. So of course they can be directly experienced. They can also be witnessed and they also can be indirectly experienced. And so when we talk about indirect exposure to trauma, we're typically talking about uh, secondary traumatic stress. So that's, of course, the, um, the what can happen to us uh, oftentimes to helping professionals in the course of our professional duties. So whereby we are um, being exposed to the traumatic content of our clients and, and can actually begin to experience symptoms that way. We're also talking about historical trauma when we talk about indirect exposure to trauma. And so then the second E that I was talking about, and Natalie, if you wanna just go back for a quick second, sorry. Um, the second E that I'm talking about is the experience of trauma. So when we talk about trauma, we really have to consider an individual's experience of it because no two individuals will experience th the same event in the same way. And that is in large part because trauma has so much to do with our perceptions of the event and in particular our perception of what the event says and what how we interpret and assign meaning to the event in terms of who we are and how we move through the world, how we interact with other individuals, and then also our broader worldview. And then lastly is the effects of the event. And so Natalie, if you wanna to go to the next slide now, that would be great. So uh, we know that following a traumatic event, all individuals will experience a, an acute stress response, right? And that's the body and brains and spirits way really of trying to metabolize the event and help us manage and respond to whatever threat may be, may be in front of us. Um, for many individuals, they'll go on to recover from that acute stress response, but others will experience a potential range of short and long-term effects that can really exist throughout their lifespan. And so you might wonder, well, why does one individual go on to um, have an acute stress response that resolves and other individuals go on to experience distress or impairment? And that's really because of the complicated interaction that occurs um, from all different levels, these risk and protective factors that might exist at all different levels of our ecological system, as well as the type and characteristics of the trauma and developmental and cultural influences. Um, and so it's really, uh, it's really about trying to understand within the context of an individual's experience how these different risk and protective factors might play into um, their own experience of the traumatic event. I also just want to note that individuals also frequently adopt coping mechanisms, right, to try to deal with some of the primary effects, what we sometimes refer to as primary effects of trauma, right? So individuals, for example, might develop post-traumatic stress disorder, and then in an effort to cope with some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, they uh, may turn to other um, coping mechanisms that at first might be adaptive, but might become maladaptive over time. A good example of this, of course, is substance misuse, right? So individuals sometimes begin to use substances in an effort to kind of dull or manage distressing symptoms of trauma. And then of course, over time that can lead to other difficulties. And if you'll go to the next slide. And so as Natalie mentioned, there is this known link between trauma and, and homelessness, um, but there's still much to be learned about it. And so this is a, some of the prior research that's been conducted about the link. We know that traumatic experiences, when they're experienced in, in early childhood, as well as in adulthood, are really interlinked with homelessness in a, in a variety of different ways. And it really appears to be a two-way relationship. So trauma in early life, on the one hand, is a predictor of homelessness in adulthood. And we also know that older adults in particular who are experiencing homelessness are likely to report having experienced trauma during childhood or adolescence. And, and oftentimes what's reported is various types of interpersonal violence and, and child maltreatment. We also know that traumatic events in adulthood can actually lead to a path of homelessness. And that can happen either directly, where as a consequence of the traumatic event, they end up um, homeless, or through this pathway of psychological trauma, whereby the, the 
the symptoms and difficulties that they're experiencing as a result, as a consequence of the trauma, then lead to difficulties that can uh, eventually result in homelessness. Homelessness itself can also be considered a traumatic life experience for a variety of reasons, right? One is the lack of a sense of place, the lack of a sense of belonging, the lack of a home that of course can accompany homelessness. But it also can increase the risk of victimization and violence. And so it also has been found to perpetuate this cycle of, of re-traumatization among individuals who are experiencing homelessness and, and have trauma histories. And if you'll go to the next slide. And then we also want to just mention uh, some of the research specific to older adults who are experiencing homelessness, because we know that they have some, um, some specific needs um, and difficulties and risks that are higher than the general population of those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and so, you know, by and large, homelessness can be a lot riskier for older people um, in terms of the risk to their health, as well as the risk of, of harm. Um, it's associated with what you see up here on this screen. So chronic health conditions, higher levels of cognitive impairment, limited health access, uh, poor mental and, and, and physical health. Um, limited access to social supports that might be available to those who are not experiencing homelessness, as well as increased risk of victimization and having to experience the discrimination and negative stigma that is sometimes, oftentimes associated with, um, with homelessness. Um, so I'm going to move now and talk about the study. Um, so given um, that we know that older adults face, di face different challenges um, than younger people in finding and maintaining housing, um, we, there is some research um, and literature on um, older adults' experiences with homelessness, um, but really more is needed to understand their perspectives um, on both personal and systemic levels um, to help um, older people find housing for good. Um, and so this study really came about through a collaboration with myself and Dr. Susan Buccino, who works in the College of Public Health at the University of Louisville. And we, um, this was really a, a, a study grounded in the a community. We worked with um, a, a day service center in Louisville, Kentucky, um, and sort of talked with them about what they wanted to know. Um, and so we started this study really wanting to learn from the perspective of older men experiencing chronic homelessness. And we wanted to learn from their perspective what, um, what factors contributed to their difficulty in maintaining housing. And so our original um, research questions are listed here. Um, how do participants describe their journey in and out of homelessness? And then what contributes to participants' inability to maintain housing? So um, the, our study really heavily relied on um, the cooperation and help of this service center in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, they helped us locate and recruit participants who, um, who were homeless at the time of our interview, but had been housed within the past two years. Um, and so staff helped us connect with potential participants and we, um, our research team, you know, hung out at the center and talked to people who potentially would um, be open to an interview. Um, and we ended up interviewing um, 25 men in total. And the data presented here just come from 18 of those men who um, are were 50 and older. And in our interviews, um, we focused on um, these topics. We wanted to talk to participants about their own story about how they became homeless. We asked for their descriptions of personal and systemic issues that they felt connected to their difficulty in maintaining housing. And then we also wanted to know from their perspective what they felt like would have been helpful for them um, in uh, maintaining housing. So um, we recorded all of the interviews digitally and we transcribed them. Um, all of the, the data here, um, you'll see a name attached to the data and those are all pseudonyms. Um, just to protect participants' um, identity. <clears throat> and Susan Puccino, um, this colleague at UofL, she and I worked together to analyze the data. <clears throat> I can answer any specific questions about that, but we used typical qualitative methods to analyze the data. And I'm gonna talk about some of the themes um, here that we found. Um, so again, our original study was wanting to focus on um, 
you know, the, the pathways in and out of homeless, homelessness for these men who we talked with. Um, but as we reviewed the data, um, the tra trauma was this reoccurring theme that came up in our conversations. And so when participants talked with us about their difficulty in maintaining housing, um, their inability to free themselves from the cycle of homelessness could not be discussed without talking about their trauma. And so because of that, we focused um, on trauma from this in our first paper, which is cited here, um, the one that John mentioned. Um, and so in this paper, we um, focus on answering this particular question. So the research question here um, is what kinds of trauma experiences are encountered by older men experiencing chronic homelessness? And four themes were identified that capture the impact of trauma on the lives of these older homeless men who we talked with. <clears throat> so first, um, the, uh, the men we spoke with talked about traumatic experiences that precipitated homelessness, and these events happened in childhood and as adults. And then um, they also talked about how homelessness itself was traumatic. And there are three main themes that connect to this um, idea of homelessness as trauma itself. Um, and these are one, um, that homelessness was viewed as imprisonment, uh, whereby the men experienced a lack of choice and a lack of personal agency. Second, the participants shared common experiences of mistreatment and a mismatch of services as they sought help. And then lastly, participants experienced a uh, limited psychological safety that seemed to develop in response to some other physical vulnerabilities um, that were inherent to homelessness. Um, so I'm gonna talk about each of these four themes and I'm gonna present um, some data that go with them. Okay, so this first theme um, has to do, again, uh, we you know titled it Trauma Precip Precipitating Homelessness. Um, so the participants shared really candidly um, about um, adverse experiences in childhood and adulthood. Um, they discussed really painful stories of loss, um, various kinds of trauma across the life course. Um, the formative years of, of many of these um, participants were characterized by you know, inconsistent caregiving and unstable homes. Um, in many ways, their traumatic childhoods um, seem to connect to their present situation and that many of them um, seem to never really develop healthy, secure relationships. And they demonstrated kind of a, a lack of life skills in, in many areas. Um, many of them didn't complete high school. They had to grow up quickly. Um, and the men, you know, described um, complex and complicated childhoods. Um, this first quote here is from a guy named Darby. He worked full time as a cook. <coughs> Excuse me. And he shared um, about his childhood. Um, my mom, she couldn't find a babysitter to babysit all of us. And so somebody called the state on us and they took us from her. <clears throat> I ended up being in seven boys institutions and 13 foster homes for my whole entire life. Uh, the second quote here from Tobias, um, he described an estranged relationship with his father who died when he was a teenager. And then beyond childhood, uh, participants also shared about traumatic experiences in adulthood. And many of them had relocated to Louisville to escape grief or stress, like a parent's death, or some of them had even um, relocated to, um, you know, after experiencing a natural disaster, things like this. Um, and like Sarah talked about, you know, many of them reported using drugs or alcohol to escape difficult emotions. Um, this example here from Tony, um, he talks about what happened after he and his partner lost custody of their children. And he recounted how difficulty tolerating his emotions led to substance use, which then led to subsequent consequence consequences. Um, he said, I winded, I wind up getting on a binge that after that, because I felt a lot of resentment, remorse, and regret, and that kind of spiraled out. And that's what caused me to go back to prison. Um, I'm going to move on now to, to the three themes that connected to how homelessness itself was traumatic. Um, participants discussed um, the ways in which homelessness kind of robbed them of their um, uh, self-determination and autonomy. 
Um, and we had a lot of quotes where the participants on their own described um, or compared homelessness to imprisonment. And um, they all had been, all the men we had interviewed had been in jail or prison. And so for us, this metaphor carried a lot of weight because they knew what that was like. Um, here, this quote in the upper left hand, um, Randall, age 71, um, described shelters in this way. He said, it's a jail cell, it's no life. If you want no life, then go for it. But if you want a clean life, it's time now to do it. Um, like being jailed, um, homeless, the, the guys we talked to felt bound and constrained by many of the policies and the regulations um, that were put in place from the homeless services and the programs. Um, they really expressed kind of a weariness of not being able to, to go you know, where they wanted and eat what they wanted and, and come and kind of come and go as they pleased. Um, men who utilized the overnight shelters felt kind of confined um, by the rules inherent in these programs, such as maintaining sobriety or placing limits on their personal belongings. Um, and, you know, the confining aspects of homelessness seemed to, not surprisingly, um, you know, bring about injury to their pride and self-esteem. Um, and many of them already kind of felt hopeless and defeated about their situation. Um, also, um, the data highlighted this idea of silence and solitude that kind of eluded people who lived in shelters. Um, and if you can imagine living in congregate spaces, kind of it, it brings about you know constant stimulation and constant noise. Um, there's this quote from Randall in the bottom left. Um, he um, had been housed up to a couple of weeks before we interviewed him. And he said, you know, I started to think about how quiet things was. I could go in and lay down when I wanted to. I didn't have to wait until they tell me I could go in there and lay down. I could go in anytime I wanted to. I could go to the store and cook. Um, we had another guy who talked about how monks had it right when they talked about how you needed some quietness because he just couldn't get that um, in, in his situation. Um, and then this quote in the upper right-hand column from, or upper right-hand of the slide, um, from Charles, um, the cycle of homelessness was compared to imprisonment also just this kind of idea of being trapped. Um, so Charles um, talked about several episodes of homelessness that had happened um, since he was 40. I mean, he spent also many years in prison. So he said, you know, it's painful. I keep telling myself, I keep bumping my head like this. I need to get into something and stay in pay my bills. I'm tired of going around in a circle. I'm tired of going around in the circle. Um, so again, this image of just being trapped um, in this place that he didn't want to be. Um, so a second aspect of how homelessness itself was traumatic um, was what the participants talked about um, in terms of a lack of empathy and a lack of professionalism from some service providers. Um, and, and again, definitely not everyone, but it was enough for us to kind of see that it was a pervasive issue. Um, but they talked about interactions with case managers that were often characterized by negativity and a lack of understanding. Um, this quote from Lawrence, um, he said, I couldn't get them to understand what I needed. Nobody wanted to understand me. I just needed understanding. Like if something's wrong, don't try to say it's my fault. Yeah, if something's wrong, understand me and the reason why something is wrong. Don't try to try to put faults on anyone. Um, Charles, in this quote at the bottom, he um, shared pretty tearfully about an incident in which a shelter staff was unwilling to make accommodations for him. He wanted to leave the shelter um, to go see his wife, who was um, in the hospital dying, and he, um, you know, had to risk losing his bed. He just felt like the situation. Um, it was, it, he felt very unheard and, and felt like he was treated very unsympathetically in this situation. That was kind of an emergency. Um, so again, we heard stories of housing discrimination, unfair treatment um, by folks who were really charged with helping and supporting these men. Um, and again, the recurrence of this data um, for us suggested, you know, some, it's, it was kind of a pervasive um, pervasive thing. Um, some of the things specifically, you know, again, frustration about workers not following through, not keeping their word, 
not believing them, not giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, this quote from Michael in the upper right hand um, kind of summarizes the idea. He says, it's hard for a homeless person to get his foot. If he wants to get his feet on solid ground, it's hard because the system that's supposed to be helping you is actually draining you. Um, a final theme um, related to this idea of homelessness as trauma um, was is just the, the physical danger and the external threats that were experienced by the guys who we talked with. Um, all of the 18 older participants had at least two chronic health conditions that they reported to us. And many of them had limited mobility and just exacerbated physical vulnerability. This quote from Nick in the upper left hand, he said, you know, being homeless is wearing me out. My body is tore up the past couple of years. Um, participants reported, report, reported being constantly on guard against different threats, so physical threats, um, threats of the elements like the cold and the heat and the rain, um, threats of physical harm like threats from you know, others um, hurting them physically, assaulting them, harassing them, um, threats of just loss of property, of, of people taking things from them. Um, so there's a kind of a hypervigilance that we saw from participants. They felt kind of unable to to let their guard down. Um, this quote from Marcos in the bottom right hand, um, he talked about this kind of speaks to the risks of sleeping out. Um, once you're asleep, anybody can get you if you're outside. Um, Lawrence, this quote in the upper right hand, he talked about a physical attack and injuries that he had sustained as a result of this attack. Um, he said, I got jumped on back in October, hit over the head with a crowbar on my left side, my leg is messed up, my hip is messed up. That's why I stay in pain in my hip. They had tried to rob me, but they couldn't get what I had. They dragged me in the alley and left me in the alley for dead. I could barely walk, but I made it out of the alley and I made it right up to the health center. Um, many of the guys we talked with spoke about this kind of predicament between sleeping out and going into a shelter because neither of those felt like really good options for them. Um, you know, shelters kind of protected you um, uh, from the rain, from the elements, but then also um, shelters also didn't feel like a safe place. So there's this quote from Felix, um, and he was talking about um, sleeping in shelters, and he described them as dangerous. And he said, you know, you just, they're, he just felt like they were aggressive people staying in shelters, and they didn't feel like a safe place place for him. <coughs> so, um, so again, those are kind of the big four themes that how we um, saw in the data that homelessness was traumatic. There was trauma kind of precipitating homelessness, and then homelessness itself was trauma in that it was compared to imprisonment. The participants felt mistreated by service providers, and then they faced external threats um, as a result of homelessness. Um, just to give, as we present the findings, it's important to kind of note some limitations with the study. Um, we did not formally uh, screen for cognitive impairment, um, but as we inter started interviewing people and, and definitely read through the data, it's, it's likely that some of our participants um, may have had cognitive impairments, which, which might speak to the, the data. I, I don't think that we, I think the data is quality and it, it for sure communicates their perceptions and their experiences, but I do think it's important to mention that. Um, and related to that, you know, we had a research team um, that included three graduate students. And this is not necessarily an easy population to interview. Um, and so I think um, some of the, the students in particular, I think, but all of us, I think, you know, we um, perhaps maybe missed spots where we could have followed up because we are not, only one of us worked in homeless services. And so I think um, we did the best we could to follow up and to probe and to get details, but certainly that, um, I think with having new interviewers, um, that's kind of a limitation inherent in the process. Um, and we didn't, we didn't ask about trauma specifically. Um, so again, trauma was this theme that came up very clearly in our interviews, but we didn't go in asking about trauma. And so it's, it's, um, it's likely that we could have got different data or richer data or, you know, 
something like that if we had specifically asked about trauma, which we didn't, but it was very much um, a theme that resonated in all of the data, um, so much so that our first paper kind of focused on it. But, but we also just, again, to kind of make plain, we didn't explicitly ask about trauma. Um, and so I think I'm gonna hand things over to Sarah now. So um, thank you, Sandalee. So I think, uh, so uh, we have a few slides on conclusions and implications that I'm just going to walk you through. And I, you know, as Natalie just said, taken as a whole, trauma emerged as this really important consideration. For and I think that although um, Natalie just noted some of the limitations of the fact that the that trauma wasn't specifically asked about. Um, I think it also speaks to how prevalent it was in, in these individuals' lives that it emerged so strongly as a theme when the point of the original study had nothing to do with trauma, right? And it was more experiencing, or excuse me, um, looking at their these individuals' pathways back into homelessness and, um, and better understand their lived experiences. Uh, so, um, you know, as Natalie just mentioned, when she reviewed the findings, these older men spoke uh, and described personal histories that were filled with various types of traumatic events and, and the findings really enforced the known links that we talked about um, at the beginning of our presentation. The interviews also suggested that some of these men were very likely experiencing trauma-related symptoms and particularly um, we have hypervigilance there as an example. So particularly those um, uh, symptoms of trauma within uh, that fall within the uh, alterations in arousal um, symptom cluster, right, of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. So we saw a lot of that being on the lookout for danger um, and, and hypervigilance that can accompany that. I think we also saw, there was also evidence in the data of um, some intrusive and re-experiencing symptoms that were causing distress at times. Um, and, and, and those types of, of symptoms in particular can make it especially difficult to function and sustain in shelter set settings, per, given what Natalie was explaining about that, the lack of quiet, right, and the constant stimulation and the constant noise that often um, is a part of shelter environments and, and congregate living. And so, you know, the findings suggest also that the very structures and programs and people who were responsible and tasked with helping these individuals and, and individuals who are experiencing homelessness more broadly were at times potentially re-traumatizing these individuals. And that played out in a couple of different ways. One was the physical safety risks that were evident in the findings um, in regards to uh, not feeling safe in the shelters, but also the, the, the physical safety risks that ex existed outside of shelter environments. The clear lack of psychological safety. Um, and, and, and when we're talking about psychological safety, really talking about that sense of feeling safe, right? Um, so even when our, when our physical surroundings and we, we may know on a cognitive level, oh, we can look around and we're safe, oftentimes individuals who are experiencing the adverse impact of trauma lack that sense of physical, or excuse me, psychological safety or just kind of feeling safe. Um, and then also there was, there was constant uh, mention of the restricted autonomy and choice that was prevalent in many shelter set settings, settings, excuse me, and how that really um, almost mirrored individuals' experiences in jail um, and restricted their autonomy and, and sense of choice and, 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 and efficacy. Um, and then lastly, as Natalie noted, there was a clear expression among the men that they definitely perceived service providers that time to really lack empathy um, and oftentimes follow through, uh, which also played into um, the potential for, for re-traumatization. I think we can move on, Natalie, to the next slide. And so it was interesting because, you know, the findings overall really supported this need for a trauma-informed care approach and service provision. And it was interesting me, interesting to me, I think, as well, because what we found is was that the, the themes that emerged really directly related 
to the six key principles of trauma-informed care, right? And so those six key principles, depending on the framework of trauma-informed care that you look at, sometimes these key principles are, have slightly different uh, titles or language, but by and large, the different frameworks that are available talk about these six principles. And so I'll just name them, they're there in parentheses, but first is promoting a sense of psychological and physical safety, um, promoting uh, number two, trustworthiness and transparency, including opportunities uh, for peer support, and then collaboration and mutuality, um, empowerment, voice, and choice, and then, of course, attending to cultural, historical, and gender issues. And so if you think about those different themes that emerged, you can see how they really encompassed these different aspects of trauma-informed care. And I just want to note, too, that as an organizational and systemic approach, the goals of trauma-informed care are that the entire uh, service system, right? So we're talking about from the service providers themselves to the structures and policies um, and all staff that work there, not just staff that are, that are engaging with, um, with clients that there is a, a, an acknowledgement of the impact of trauma on individual communities and that individuals and service providers are able to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, staff, and others who are involved with the system so as to try to minimize the likelihood of re-traumatization. And then that there's this integration of knowledge about trauma into the very policies, procedures, and practices of the, of the system. Um, and I think we're ready for the for the implication slide. And so I want to try. We want to. We we really wanted to try to bring this down to what are some practical implications from the data. Um, and so I think there's several um, there's several practical implications that we pulled out. Um, you know, first of all, I think that if it's implemented, a trauma informed care framework really may help to reduce the risk of re traumatization, as well as attend to some of these other concerns that were noted. Um, by participants in this study. Um, and so some of, some of what we saw a need for was number one, screening for trauma and developing referral processes to other trauma-focused or trauma-informed services. So these would be like mental health screenings um, and referral processes for mental health, physical health care, uh, substance use services, and so forth and so on. And I'll just mention that there are um, many screeners that are out there that are pretty easily accessible, that are short, um, and that are in the public domain so that there's not costs associated with service systems implementing them into their, into their, into their, um, into their care. Um, the, the second implication was really that there was a need for the development uh, for trauma-informed safety safety plans with, with clients. So a lot of service systems that have implemented trauma-informed care as a framework, as an organizational framework, have adopted um, uh, trauma-informed safety plans, which they use in clients with clients. And so these can look different depending on the clients, but es essentially what you're doing is help working in collaboration with the client to help them identify what trauma reminders and triggers might exist for them, right? Um, and whether those are situations uh, sensations they might experience, strong emotional states, right, when we are experiencing trauma reminders that can really run the gamut and it can be experienced in all of our different senses as well. Um, and so, and then they also try to identify, well, what are the early warning signs that I may be uh, experiencing a trauma reminder or I may be um, headed towards um, uh, some sort of um, distress? And then it also identifies um, coping skills, right, and strategies that that individual can use and also helpful things that the people around that individual may use to engage them and, and, and support them in that way. There was also an, a clear implication of, of creating shelter environments that are physically safe um, and putting strategies in place that promote a sense of physical safety, of course, but also the psychological safety as it really emerged as a key finding um, for both clients, of course, and staff. Um, and one, I think, <clears throat> Consideration within this is, is the use of low barrier shelters that really can minimize the restriction um, to those who are trying to access emergency services while also addressing issues such as poor mental health. And low barrier shelters, of course, are going to do their best to maximize a sense of empowerment um, and uh, self-efficacy and choice 
um, which again goes back to those principles of trauma-informed care. And then lastly, I just want to you know, note that implementation and implementation science broadly has taught us a lot about when we try to implement these new organizational frameworks and, and technologies and services into our service systems. Um, and it's not something that is quick or necessarily easy. And so it's also important that when we're adopting trauma-informed frameworks or other frameworks for that matter, that we're, we're really thinking about it thoughtfully and, and looking at what the potential barriers might be and providing ongoing training and support so that we can assist um, uh, individual agencies or service systems in, uh, in, in promoting sustainability, right, of those new practices. And I'll hand it back to you, Natalie. Um.